Welcome Divanauts to Cronista de Indias, the YouTube channel dedicated to Latin American studies by Dr. Andrea Lorena Fernandez. Follow on Instagram for more cultural content. Found a random classroom at Pace University which was empty. This is actually the third time I get kicked out of a classroom or a conference room. Uh, so the struggle to record this is it's pretty hard throughout the week. I'm not wearing the cat ears even though I promised because of the trekking I had to do for about uh, 30 minutes to find that place to record it. But um, if you take a look, I found a, a pretty great view. The people in that building are real posh. I hate them. I totally want to live on that terrace in the summer. Okay, so in the last episode, episode 22, titled Sufragistas, Part 1, Maria Bella Ramirez, Basic Plan for Vindication of the Rights of Women, 1904. We studied Maria Bella's contribution to the collective feminist movement. We talked about suffrage and first wave feminism. Is it, a cult is it cultural imperialism or a product of europhilia? We also talked about the progression between first wave into second wave noting that it's a gradual transition for women in Latin America. Lastly, we uh, studied some notes by Francesca Miller in Latin American Women and the Search for Social Justice. In this present episode, episode 22, titled Sufragistas Part 2, Doctora Ernestina Lopez, keynote at Argentina's first International Congress, 1910, we study the contributions of this particular suffragette to the feminist movement between 1879 and 1965. Those are her day dates, uh, her life dates. We second point is the relationship between education and patriotism in the keynote speech from 1910, and what does it mean, number three, to be a feminist in 1910, according to Dr. Ernestina Lopez, and the. Um, we talk about the question of women's education and economic condition as a continuity between first and second wave feminism, according to Ernestina. And last, we talk about anti-feminisms, according to Susan K. Bessis in Reconstructing Patriarchy, the Modernization of Gender Inequality in Brazil from 1914 to 1940, published in 1996, to get a broader, broader context about uh, what Ernestina says in her keynote speech. So, a little bit about Ernestina. She lives, as I said, from 1879 to 1965. She's an educator and director of the Sarmiento Model School, founder and director of Liceo Nacional de Señoritas. She's the first woman to earn a Doctor of Philosopher degree in letters from the University of Buenos Aires and joined the Asociación de Mujeres Universitarias Argentinas, o AMUA, in 1902, which organized the first International Feminist Congress of Argentina in 1910, which is the one featured in this episode. As one of the first female faculty members of the University of Buenos Aires after 1918, she advocated a curriculum feature, featuring hygiene, sex education, universal suffrage, and civic responsibilities. Her publications include La Escuela y la Vida, Lecciones de Pedagogía y Práctica, a book on teaching and pedagogy, second book, Ideas Femeninas de Nuestra América, uh, actually, Ideas Feministas de Nuestra América from 1910, Feminist Ideas of Our America, probably a play on Jose Martí's Our America essay. Uh, and lastly, uh, among other books, are Elementos de Botánica Experimental from 1914, so from feminism to botany. This woman studied very many subjects. She's also a founding member of the Inter-American Commission on Women in 1928, an organization which is still active today. We move on to the relationship between education and patriotism in her keynote speech presented at the International Women's Congress in the Republic of Argentina. She addresses, first of all, university trained women in the audience. Note that second wave feminist movement in Latin America consists mostly of white, middle and upper class contributors. Maria Bella Ramirez from the previous episode, episode 21, and Ernestina Lopez are products of first wave feminism. They invoked um, where women entered the male-dominated sphere of higher education. These women invoked Republican motherhood, where raising tomorrow's children necessitated the improvement of female education and economic independence. They have little concern for the female urban proletariat, the indigenous communities of their own countries, and rural women beyond Buenos Aires. This is one of the criticisms they receive. Uh, later on. And the movement is lastly Europhilic. So here's a quote from the keynote. 
Argentine women have circulated a pamphlet informing our sisters of the old world that an association of university-trained women is convoking an international women's congress to honor the anniversary of their homeland's independence. And this leads us to the uh, second topic of today's lesson. Uh, she promotes the notion that 1910s feminists are natural heirs 100 years in the making to the worthy ladies of 1810 meaning that brave women who contributed to Latin American independence from Spain, um, there's an association between the two, an artificial one, of, uh, although. Please see episodes 10, the Juanas of the Soberanas Repúblicas, 11, Colombia's Policarpa Salabarrieta, 12, Mexico's Carmen Camacho, 13, Ecuador's Angela Batalla, and 14, also Ecuador's Manuela Sáenz. Another quote from the keynote says, if the worthy ladies of 1810 offered the world a great example of valor and selflessness, no female feats must be selfless to merit admiration. Uh, continue with the quote. By alongside their husbands and sons, not faltering in the face of danger, those of 1910 do no less in assuming the responsibility for an initiative being taken for the first time in this country and on which the future success of the cause of women may depend. In other countries of the world, this movement enjoys not only an army of committed female members, but in turn, in turn that half a century ago would have seemed even more improbable, ardent male supporters. You should know. One, feminism between 1810 and 1910 implies valor and selflessness, vestiges of the colonial Marianismo, see episode 4, and post-independence first wave Republican motherhood, for this you may see episode 10. Both groups of patriots face danger in defending and improving their country's lot. La for, uh, third, feminism is an international movement with male participants, unlike 1810. We're going to problematize that later on in this episode. Last, Ernestina Lopez is engaging in an anachronism to historicize her suffragist rhetoric. The ladies of the independence period were by no means feminist. They did not think of themselves as such, did not know the word, nor were they fighting for improving women's lot. They fought for independence for within the constraints of the ideology of common good, of the Enlightenment, their condition as women was hardly an afterthought in their political and public agency. So in 1910, according to Doctora Ernestina Lopez, what is feminism? She says, one, refusing confinement and service. Two, new professions for women, like teachers, newspaper editors, doctors, artists, and workers, elevate the material and moral status of their sex. 3. Feminism does not weaken the family. 4. Women's selflessness redeems and benefits males. 5. Feminists advocated against slavery. and 6. Women's duties include global sisterhood, unite social classes, dispel negative stereotypes, uh, create a forum for factory and domestic workers, qualifications uh, equals merit, and womanly means nonpartisan and secular. So this is the section in which Ernestina actually think of, thinks of the urban proletariat, which is unlike a lot of uh, early second wave feminists, which are only preoccupied with upper uh, middle class urban uh, wealthy ladies. On the question of women's education and economic condition, a continuation of first wave feminism into the second one, we talk about let's first let's first talk about education. She sees the she sees diversification of domestic training as beneficial for the nation. Females' roles in educating the family has a greater impact on society than male education, and uneducated women turn superficial and adverse to emancipation. In terms of economics, Ernestina says. Con confront life with misguided incomplete education is de a detriment to the whole of society. Uh, economic solvency means that if salaries go towards women, they will eventually go towards the family, whereas for males, it may not necessarily do so. Likelier to contribute to the help to help the less fortunate means that women's economic solvency will be beneficial. She advocates for workplace protection against exploitation, unsanitary conditions, and poverty. The goals of feminism as of 1910 are, in conclusion, quote, the goals of feminism are based on the natural right, note the vocabulary of the Enlightenment reappears from 1810, now in the service of an organized, institutionalized feminist movement, of the individual, freedom to work, benefits of a broad education, the right to take an active interest in the things and people that surround one. These are legitimate aspirations that, once attained, will allow a woman 
to fully realize her great humanistic mission. Susan, B., uh, Susan K. Biss, in The Limits of Reform and Bivalent Feminisms and Anti-Feminisms, an essay in Reconstructing Patriarchy, The Modernization of Gender Inequality in Brazil, 1914-1940, uh, a book published in 1996 by University of North Carolina Press, she explains that women's fear of rejecting traditional norms when faced with male hostility in the early feminist movement led to controversy over women's suffrage, education, and work beyond the home, and how it would affect gender relations in the early 20th century. There is a recurrent taboo over seeming selfish, uh, refusal to reject imagined natural order where men dominate the public sphere, the role of Catholicism, where femininity is educated to is equated to Christian piety, which uh, reinforces a hierarchy, abnegations, cannot divorce husbands and family, and marriage seen as both women's fulfillment and oppression at the same time. Male supporters of feminism, contrary to Ernestina Lopez's characterization of ardent, that's a that's a strong adjective, in 1910, were at best oblivious and at worst dismissive. Non-combative feminism eventually won male approval but did not alter their views on the natural order. Non-combative feminisms justified the movement stating non-combative feminists uh, they stated it, it, that the movement was not a threat to domesticity or binary gender standards. It was a symbol of modernity and useful for public morality. Yet opinions varied. 17 male intellectuals were polled by a magazine A Vida Moderna uh, from Brazil in 1927, and the, the scholar says, more commonly, well-educated men tended to be reluctant to denounce feminism outright, but very few could tolerate the idea of equality between the sexes. Note that this is male intellectuals. They are a very reduced uh, pool. Only 17 of them were polled. Anti-feminisms were actually more common among the male public. The book cites a post-World War II publication by uh, such Pedro Tax, uh, where he says, in short, feminisms want, consciously or unconsciously, to turn the world upside down, to render it more and more uninhabitable, to anarchize it, and to set it in opposition to today's practice that may be found on a country, a state where female grace prevails and where the daughters of Eve are, by virtue of their tenderness and affections, mistresses of their home and queens. Hashtag so triggered right now, so triggered. The detractors of the feminist movements have changed very little in the last century uh, from Pedro Tax. And, well, Pedro, I don't really like the queendom you've assigned to us uh, by, some, by somebody with false notions of inferiority. Bess's essay concludes with, quote, Accepting the values and norms of bourgeois capitalist society, feminists help to integrate women more fully into it. Although individually and collectively, urban, middle, and upper class women most certainly benefited, and although they introduced principles and set precedents that could be used later to pry open further the system for greater numbers of women, the immediate gains for the poor majority were negligible to non-existent. Indeed, in their victories, feminists, co feminists contributed to the strengthening and legitimization of the new bourgeois order. In conclusion, episode 22 of Latin American Divas, Sufragistas, part 2, Doctora Ernestina Lopez, keynote at Argentina's first International Women's Congress of 1910, we talked about Dr. Ernestina's contributions to the feminist movement during her lifetime, the relationship between education and patriotism in her keynote speech of 1910, we talked about what it means to be a feminist according to her in 1910, and the question of women's education and economic condition as a gradual transition between first and second wave feminism. Lastly, we ended with notes on anti-feminism by Susan Bess in Reconstructing Patriarchy, uh, published in 1996. In the next episode, we're going to study Soldaderas, part one, Amazons of the Mexican Revolution in popular culture from 1910 to 1920. This will be episode 23. Thank you for taking the time to learn more about Latin American Divas right here on Cronista de Indias, where new episodes drop whenever I find a room of my own to record this thing in that I am not being continuously kicked out of. Um, so, uh, okay, 
digression, please hit the subscribe button so you never miss an episode, even though I am hashtag so angry right now, so triggered. Um, and as always, a million thanks for uh, viewing, sharing, liking the episodes. Uh, please leave a comment below. Tell us what you think about the current status of Latin American divas. Um, and as always, hashtag you are going to do epic shit. Do epic shit is our motto. Uh, have a wonderful afternoon.